happy Tuesday morning. How you guys doing? Looky there, I've I got I got the th- three amigos today. Amen. Pastor Freddie Bear. Yep. How you doing, my dear brother? You know, I like to think that I'm doing all things considered, uh, living in a sin cursed world of my as yet unredeemed body. Um, <laughs> I couldn't get any better. Than, yeah. Than, uh, oh, you could get better after you uh, get your infusion. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's that sin cursed body that I'm in a body of sin, body of flesh that I still yeah. have. That. In other words, you really don't want to get better. You just don't want to hurt quite as much. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, the, uh, how's, uh, Marilyn, how's the, how, how's the dog? How's, Good. how's everybody? She got up this morning, put Fiona on a leash and went out and did her laps and walked around. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> excellent. Uh, in the Beckemeyer compound. Yeah. Well, there was, um, there's not a lot, there wasn't a lot going on in the, uh, uh, Grace News arena and, um, in the Christian news, everybody's talking about the, uh, earthquake out in turkey i uh, know those people that died and um i had a uh i had an article i don't know if um oh here if anybody's interested there's a, i had an article of uh all the or just a bunch of videos of all the homemade videos of buildings collapsing and stuff oh. and i mean you watch it and it's like apocalyptic you know, and I can't help but think of the earthquakes during the tribulation. Yeah. And I'm just like, this is what tribulation is going to look like to a, to a degree. You know, all of that just de- destruction. And I would have thought that have brought out a lot of lot of articles, a lot of supposition about, you know, why was it happening now? Oh, are we in the end times? Yeah. You know, there's all oh, the Christians are all doing that nonsense. I remember yeah. being in Bible college in 1970 and, uh, a lot of discussion about well look at all the wars look at all the, the, earth, the earthquakes you know uh at this time they were looking for it even yeah. back way back when oh, yeah. yeah yeah uh and then in the midst of all of this there was one little article that i absolutely loved it was on uh, faith wire which i'm going to share this little so this this little the lovely little little old lady in hawaii uh, her home lives by a uh, by um, a mountain, and this is a video. You'll actually see it on the video from an in, from a camera that's inside her house, a security camera. She's inside her house. This boulder <laughs> came rolling down off a mountain, co- just careened into her home, w- into her family room, absolutely demolished the whole hallway and bedrooms and stuff. And I mean, she had. I don't know. It looks like she was doing laundry or something. And she was just about to step into the family room when this boulder just came flying by in front of her. It's just amazing. And I guess she is at some point, I guess she is in some way, uh, the, um, uh, she's a believer because uh, her reaction to the news was, well, God was with me. Yeah. <laughs> so the Christian news sites were, could Picking been, up on it. Could have been time and change. Um, call doesn't do enough justice yeah, to sum up what happened at this Palolo home it's after a crazy. massive boulder plowed into a living room during the weekend rain, just missing one of the residents. Eddie Dowd spoke with the family and tells us the city has launched an investigation. A family of four living in this Palolo Valley home is feeling lucky to be alive. That's after a boulder crashed into their home coming from this hillside late Saturday night. Look at this video. Boom. Wow. That's Caroline Sasaki walking to her TV wow. room just before midnight on Saturday in a boulder passed right by her. I heard the loud boom, and apparently <laughs> the boulder passed right in front of me, which I didn't. Yeah, she's know. about. To I didn't see it. Thing. So the rock went through. One more step, and she would have died. Look she at that. Hopped over an SUV, which was parked right here in front of this wall. It hopped over it. I guess it crashed through here. It bounced. I guess it hit my car, bounced there, went through the, it was a sliding glass door. Isn't that amazing? The rock is right on the edge of the frame. Wow. I took one more step. <clears throat> Eddie Dowd, Hawaii News Now. So between the, um, 
Uh, between the earthquake and the little old lady, a little, a sweet little old lady and the older lady in Hawaii, you know, all of this seems to just speak to just the uncertainty of life, you know, absolutely. The, um, random unexpected events that can suddenly take your life. The, uh, no one knows how much time they have left. And so the point from a spiritual perspective is, is, you know, what Paul says, now's the time for your salvation. Now's Absolutely. the time for you to come and accept Christ as your savior, trusting in his death, burial and resurrection as a payment for sin. Hey. Now's the time. And it's also these kinds of events are reminders to us as a motivation to keep giving out the gospel. Cause you never know. You never know. Um, I know exactly what you mean. Is that, all right. Um, it's on, but nothing's happening. I don't know. It was working. <laughs> no, it's like some guy five miles away shoots a rifle in the air and kills somebody. Yeah. Five miles away. I mean. Yeah, it shoots it. Uh, Fred, say something brilliant while I try to figure that out. Yeah. Boy, I could say something, but brilliant. Uh Gets to be a test, 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 test. It was working. All of a sudden, now it's just dead. Dead air. Um, Maybe somebody on the chat room can say something brilliant. Try it again. Testing, not nothing. I'd be glad to give. Now that's I, really strange. Give him a I, talk I'm about a random. Testing. All right. Finally. That's weird. That's weird. That's no, weird. I was, but I was going here. <laughs> what I was going to share. I can remember having family members that were very elderly, had coronary disease and cancer and, and Parkinson's disease and, and all of that. And you know, one day they just sort of fall over dead and everybody's shocked, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. uh, no matter what age you are, life is, you know, the next day is just not certain, you know, the next second, what, really, you know, what, uh, it's but a vapor and appears for a little while and vanishes away. Yeah. Uh, the, on the other side of, uh, things, the news sites we're talking about, I don't know. I didn't even know the Grammys was on. I don't watch TV anymore, but some singer. What are the Grammys? <laughs> exactly. Uh, one of the singers got up and dressed up like Satan and tried to provoke the Christians. And it was all pretty horrifying looking uh, from the photos. And uh, the Christians were kind of outraged. But here we go. Babylon B said, uh, Horrified Satan distances himself from the Grammys. <laughs> In a rare public <laughs> statement, the Prince of Darkness has distanced himself from last night's Grammys performance by Sam Smith, which he denounced as cringy and appalling. Listen, folks, I enjoy demonic sexual perversion just as much as the next guy, but this is just too much, said the frustrated <laughs> father of lies. I'm the God of this world. I appear as an angel of light. It's supposed to be sneaky and subtle. Has Hollywood lost its ability to be subtle? What on earth happened to this town? <laughs> Hilarious. That's a great uh, it reminds me of um, uh, the uh, reminds me of um, what Jordan says. None of us should ever be surprised about unbelievers acting like unbelievers. Mm -hmm. uh, so this led to I discovered. Uh, there's a website I periodically visit when I prepare for the podcast called the vigilant C uh, citizen. And he had, he had some interesting comments that I, I don't think we've ever talked about before. I don't know if this is going to interest anybody, but, uh, for one thing, it's never stopped you before. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the th and the uh, and he what the vigilant citizen does is he just sort of chronicles all the symbolism, cultic symbolism that's that you see in media everywhere, TV, movies, 
uh, magazine covers, advertisements, all this stuff. And he and he points out what the a lot of the symbolism means because it's very it's very strate- it's very pointed, strategic. There's there are ideas going on behind the imagery that's that's co- that you're constantly seeing. And he described it as uh, it was it, it all of this intentional imagery, like at the at the Grammys, remi- brought, reminded him of something called Revelation of the Method, which originated from these ancient Rosicrucian texts, and it's an obscure concept that refers to the process of exposing the masses to dark realities, often in a veiled and underhanded manner to elicit implied acceptance. You get that? So once these uh, formally hidden truths are revealed to the public and met with general apathy, indifference, or incredulity, they become normalized and embedded Mm -hmm. in society's collective unconscious. And Mm -hmm. some occultists compare this process to the alchemical great work where the word is transmuted according to the will of the occult elite. And so here's a quote. Here's one quote from a book called Secret Societies and Psychological Warfare, Michael Hoffman. And he says, the alchemical principle of the revelation of the method has as its chief component a clown-like grinning mockery of the victims as a show of power and macabre arrogance. When this is performed in a veiled manner, accompanied by certain signs and symbols, uh, words elicits no meaningful response of opposition or resistance from the target. It's one of the most efficacious techniques of psychological warfare. And uh, it's just basically an assault on the mind. And then, like, for example, uh, you also have here, he will periodically show, you know, imagery showcasing imagery in uh, in the latest media outlets where it's all just blasphemous and awful and um, you know and what the meaning of it is here we have this superstar from South Korea and you and he's holding up this ball and it's got one and you only see one eye there's a lot of that going on in media where you only see one eye kind of like the Illuminati eye kind of thing um, a lot of uh, here we have this uh, photo. This is Gucci's Cosmo Genie campaign, and it's all very, very Masonic. Um, you have all this stuff about children, which is just awful. You know, the, the way that the children are portrayed. This is a photo of Jamie Lee Curtis's house, and she's got this awful photo of a child on there, which I don't even want to look at. The new Illuminati uh, lounge in Dubai. <laughs> but here at the bottom here, this is what. This is this is a, a point that I um, is worth making. Now, this weirdo statue in Boston is dedicated to Martin Luther King, and it's just bizarre, and it just it makes no sense. Its name is Embrace Boston. Despite its name, nobody embraced this thing. <laughs> Some claim that it looks like uh, well, a certain a member. Uh, male member of his body, and some say it looks like a feces and stuff. No matter on which side of this debate you side with, this thing actually embraces an important aspect of uh, a lot of the elite's agenda. And he this this comes from a list of commie goals about how to destroy a nation from within. And there were two and uh, two of those goals is continue discrediting American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. An American uh, commie cell was told to eliminate all good sculpture from parks and buildings, substitute shapeless, awkward, and meaningless forms. And the other one is control art critics and, and art museums, and, our pl- and their plan is to promote ugliness, repulsive, meaningless art. And I, I can't help but have noticed this, like in a lot of stuff, like just things are ugly now. Art is ugly. The design of things are just intentionally ugly and repulsive uh movies are just ugly you know the um uh and and i thought i was thinking last night that you know when it comes to psychological warfare this is all they have right and that doesn't none of it i mean before when i before i came back to church i thought you know that kind of stuff would have sent me in a spiraling depression and i would have drank like a fish but now None of that stuff gets to me at all. And none of it, none of it can even, I, I, you know, I look at it and I think unbelievers are going to act like unbelievers, even whether it's intentional, strategic or not. But 
at the same time, none of it compares to the beauty of his holiness, Amen. you know, our you, creation. Uh, yeah, exactly. Or, or creation itself, mm -hmm. the beauty of creation itself. You know, and I think we do need art in our lives. We need to see beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why God gave us this gorgeous creation. Yeah. And um, but I think but, you know, in terms of beauty, you know, there is nothing that can compare in the mind's eye. You may see those stuff. The the um, symbolism probably doesn't register with most of you. And you probably realize, too, to a certain degree, it's kind of registered that, yeah, things are getting ugly. Things are, you know. Like when I take uh, Lori and I go out, we go into a store and I'm just like, why are all these, you know, all this stuff why, it's so ugly? It's, it makes no sense. Why, who would want to have that? It's just so nat like they're intentionally repulsive. Mm. And the uh, and I think, you know, it's all intentional, but none of it compares to the beauty of his holiness. And I was reminded of um, second Corinthians. Second, I'm sorry, second Chronicles 20. 21, when the Israelites appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. You know, All right. nothing compares to that. You may live, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how artistic the world is around you, how beautiful it might be. Nothing compares to the beauty of his holiness mm -hmm. in his word, mm -hmm. in your mind's eye. And none of this other nonsense and all of this subliminal messaging and stuff, it, it, it could not... It, there's, can do nothing to a mind that is renewed, focused on his word, in love with his holiness. And um, and I think it's a, that's just a beautiful thing. So I thought, well, that's something we never talked about. So, well, <laughs> there you, know, you, there you uh, go. <laughs> I think it's a good indicator on the way that society itself uh, is headed. Well, and, media imagery uh, is constantly pushing the limits. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for us, nothing changes. Beauty of his holiness. Mm -hmm. Acting with grace and love, speech all way with grace. Nothing changes, and nothing. And you know, when you compare the one to the, you compare what the world is doing compared to what God does. There's no comparison between the two. There's no, his 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 beauty is a holy beauty that is that you that you, you can't. How can you not love it and uh, be so in love with that that everything else that's going around in this wicked world doesn't matter. You know, a lot of uh, shock. A lot of media. Uh, feeds off of what they would see as shock value. They need to have somebody look at them to, to acknowledge their existence, or maybe even to give them, to give their own, whatever they're doing, uh, some value. But you know, and it seems like the only the only way to do that is it's got to be worse than the last one. Right. So something more shocking. Yeah, than the totally. Last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So um. You know, and, and this goes back to a point that I remember Fred and Hal made when they first came here. And it was, you know, spiritual warfare is largely psychological, mm -hmm. psychological warfare. And that's mm -hmm. what the word is designed to do, to produce a whole armor in your mind mm -hmm. that will protect you from the wiles of the devil, the mm -hmm. fiery Amen. darts that are thrown at you mm -hmm. so that you can be oblivious to subliminal, whatever it is that they want to push on you. Mm -hmm. And you still stay focused on his 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 holiness and his love. And right. Grace. And the thing about the art, the armor is that it's it's defensive. Yes. You know, I, I look at evangelicalism and, and they seem to think that the church is supposed to be on offense. And um, I don't I don't think it I don't think it works that way. It's like when you read Second Thessalonians two, it talks about how the man of sin is not being revealed yet because he's being hindered mm -hmm. that that he might be revealed in his time yes amen but it goes on to say but the mystery of iniquity doth already work right and and so there's this you know this course of evil that's in the world that that started of course in the garden and uh, Satan's had his design and his plans, and you know it it moves right along. But uh, to to think that things are going to get better without the Lord Jesus Christ's return is just oh yeah, totally yeah. And uh, there is nothing in this, and there is nothing that compares to His grace and His beauty right. and mm -hmm. His holiness. There's nothing that compares. Yeah. His world can do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. Doesn't shock me. Doesn't surprise me. And uh, doesn't uh, and it doesn't affect me anymore because his grace is uh, so overwhelmingly 
uh, transformative. Um, so anyway, I, well, I just thought I would try that for a change. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. Earthquakes, rolling boulders, uh, satanic Grammys, and, and <laughs> subliminal art. messaging. There you go. <laughs> all in one, all in one opening. And you know where you can find where. The, where you can find that kind of talk only on the Grace Life podcast, yeah. <laughs> which is all about what God made you in Christ. We are your mad, bad brothers in Christ. Yeah. Mad in the sense of mid axe dispensational, bad in the sense of blessed and delivered. I'm some guy named Joel, the lowly third party of uh, Fellowship Bible Church here. These are the two leaders we've got. We've got Pastor Freddie Bear, Boo Boo Beckemeyer. Uh, uh, the pastor emeritus here at uh, our uh, Fellowship Bible Church. And at the end of the table, we got uh, Pastor Harold Leroy Beckemeyer Jr., the <laughs> Dean of Theology of the Beckemeyer Grace School of Hard Knocks, of which there is only one student, and uh, he, is, uh, he is really doing his best to just get through the class. Um, you know why we, you're considered to be the third, though? <laughs> no, there's only three of us. I mean, if there were, <laughs> well, if there I, am, I am. Uh, yeah, no. I, actually, I actually prefer to be number. I don't like being a number one guy. I like to prefer. I always excel being two or three. You know, so uh, we got to keep this going forever. Hey. You know, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, the uh, hey, we got a bunch of links beneath the video. Check it all out. We got links to all kinds of. Wonderful grace goodies. Uh, we've got all kinds of links to. There's a link to this little thing here called "Empowered by His Grace," which is all about what God made you in Christ. Romans six: That moment you believed, what happened to you? Who are you in Christ now? What do you? How do you? How do you live as a believer? Well, you got to reckon who you are first before you can know how to live and how to function as a believer and serve God in that way that He wants you to serve Him. Um, I love I, I love that subject. It goes to, it goes to uh, a grace tradition, uh, which is what we lovingly like to call our glorious identification with Christ. Hey, and um, got a bunch of other links. Uh, also, places where you can get books, get free books. You can get uh, 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 there's a digital grace radio station, Grace Messages twenty four seven. There's a page on our website where you could also financially uh, support us. Uh, it does take money to keep all this going, and any support you can offer so that we can continue in the ministry uh, would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Amen. We're just a tiny church here in Central Florida. Um, uh, outside of that, uh, we've got all kinds of uh, articles and videos. There's a few videos that posted last night, yesterday, uh, so there's some uh, new links to some new messages if you want to check that out. Uh, let's uh, see who's in the house. How you hey, guys doing? Man. What's going on? Hey, we got Cliff Matthews. We got Rick and Debs. It's good to see you. Um, uh, oh, let's look at that. How Beckenmeyer. That photo makes you look pretty young, there, doesn't it? Or is that? Uh, I like it. I like it. What's the What's the uh, What's the name of that um, resource that you used in order to get those um, images? New profile pic or something like that. All right. Yeah, those are cool. I like that. Old school. It's like out of the fifties kind of thing you know i love that kind of artistry and when it comes to art i do love i do love the 50s i love art deco i live for art yeah. deco you know that was one of my favorite periods oh, too. i love art, art deco, deco yeah. makes you feel good yeah you know and but then with so much of the architecture it's just so lifeless and so <laughs> void and so cold and um give me some good old-fashioned art deco <laughs> i love that period um so what's going on? How you guys doing? Good to see you, Chuck. Hey, we got Damon Chin in the house. He says, good morning, beautiful and faithful saints, and to our mad, bad brothers in Christ who adorn the doctrine of the grace of God our Savior in all things. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Amen. What does he mean by prove all things? Yeah. Try it out. Try it out. Test it. Prove it. Test it. it. Yeah, yeah, take it for a test drive. Um... Uh, God is good and good all the time. And all the saints said, amen. 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 Uh, hey, we got Kate Anderson in the house. How you doing, sweet sister? Great to see you. Yeah, great to see Kate. We missed an opportunity to fellowship with them yesterday. 
Um, but we'll uh, see them maybe on uh, Thursday. So, Oh, excellent. Give them both a big hug for me. Hey, we got Chris Nelson in the house. How you doing? My mad, bad back brother out there in Utah. I love you, man. I hope you're doing great. Uh, Chuck says, I've been putting Galatians 2.20 and Romans 6, 4 to 6 about who I am in Christ and what Christ has done for me at the cross. And all I can say is glory, hallelujah, to what Christ has done for us. Amen. Oh, there's more. There's more. Read my book. <laughs> there's more. Read my book. There is, you know, and I, I, I had probably... I like the way Hal phrased it. Uh, he he phrased it in such a way after I published the book that if I he had said it, he had kindly told me that before the book, I would have used that expression and uh, um, uh, used that expression and uh, given him credit for it. But uh, you know, I remember a while ago Hal said, "Look, the same tenets that you accept to get saved." Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, payment for sins. The Father turns around and says, now I want you to accept those same tenets for yourself. Now you see yourself as dead, buried, and risen with my son. Amen. I love the way he, he put that. And, um, and, I love, and, and to understand the identification, your identification with what, the victory that Christ achieved at Calvary and what that means for you personally is how... It is it is it explains what happens and why God chose to transform you in the way that he did that moment you got saved, mm. which also defines your walk, because mm. you're not a robot after you get saved. You are transformed spiritually to mm. the uttermost dead, buried. You already have his resurrection life. You already have his the, the life that Christ had after he was raised from the grave. That is your life. You are now a new creature. Behold, all things new. You are the old man, everything you were in Adam, crucified with Christ. You are literally uh, literally freed from the power and the bondage of sin. Paul said a bunch of times, in, uh, about, about a half a dozen times in uh, Romans 6, that you are freed from sin. Freed from it. Which doesn't mean that you're going to have a sinless walk. It means sin now becomes a choice for you. That's right. Which Amen. it never was before you got saved. You were in the habit of sinning and acting in the flesh. Uh, so, um, I, I, I love more than anything, the transformed life that we have hmm. through that identification with Christ and what he achieved at Calvary. It's my favorite doctrine. Yeah. When it comes, when it comes to our walk, I, it's, it's a very simple verse, but I think if we can capture what God would like for us to, to out of it, Colossians two, six, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Mm. I mean, it sounds too easy, and it's not hard uh, if we can yield to the new creature we are in Christ. Amen. But the the idea is, it's not rules, it's not regulations, it is simply walking in the same by grace through faith in our walk. Right. Well, it seems like they want to make the the concept of a Christian walk as being elusive. Uh, yeah. Almost like it's some type of rocket science, you know, that you've got to have exactly the right formula. Formula, no. And uh, you know, and again, I used to have the, the same mindset because that's what we're basically taught. that's basically what we were taught. And one of the verses that just totally revolutionized my thinking in that was Romans six nineteen, when I discovered what the mechanics of righteousness are. You know, and he said, he said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, you know, and yes, our flesh is infirm, and so is our human reasoning. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness, mm. unto holiness. And people say, well, Sin is so easy, and the Christian walk is so difficult. The mechanics are exactly the same. <laughs> even so, yeah. even you just ever. you just choose where mm. you yield. The mm. mechanics are the same. I mean, if you can yield to your fleshly nature, why can't you yield to the divine nature? Yes, amen. How do you define yield? Give, give it power, right? Give Let it, it loose. Yeah, give way to yeah. the wants and desires of a certain right. thing, element. Well, you know what Paul said in Galatians, uh, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, 
the same idea there. You know, you yield to one as opposed to the other. I think as we yield, we just allow, you know, this to, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not something we have to create on our own or to engineer, empower or what. It is the natural result of living mm -hmm. in the, in our new identity. All right. Well, I think some people are also, they're looking to become puppets. Mm. Or they're looking for God to come along with his little holy magic wand and bop them on top of the head. And all of a sudden they know everything and do everything that they're supposed to. And uh, it doesn't work that way, does it? No. It, but that doesn't mean it's complicated. No. And God's not going to violate our ability to choose. No. He's not going to override our will. He's going to allow it, and then all. Then we just need to, as Romans six says, yield to it. Um, I don't know if we said hello to Ludus. Ludus, so good to see Ludus. you. How are you doing, <coughs> Carlene? How are you? Awesome to have you here. And look at here, Chi Chiita's got her man with her. He's got a big old beard. How awesome is that? that's a uh, when you give your hubby a great big hug and a kiss for all of us. That means three hugs and three kisses. I love the beard. Uh, that's awesome. Um, uh, Cliff says, imagine that edified by Babylon B. <laughs> uh, and best thing and best thing. Um, best thing about that kind of approach with Babylon B is a no nice sense of humor that puts everything in its proper place. Mm. It's like God gave us humor. Yeah. Think, anyway. you know? mm -hmm. um, instead of freaking out, you're not surprised by unbelievers acting like unbelievers. And you know what? You get a little joke in too. Uh, Chuck says, Brother Joel and panel uh, in Romans uh, chapter 7 is Paul talking about before he was saved or after he was saved. Uh, there is a dis d debate about that. Um, there is uh, much, um, uh, there are, I have read some books that would make that case. I would argue no. He was, this was before he got saved, and I would say this for a variety of reasons. But I, I have I have had pushback on that view many, many times. And the uh, pastors, dude. you're welcome to <laughs> uh you're you're welcome to give me any pushback you like. The, the I don't know. Well, that's right. Yeah, you know, the thing I like uh, when I look at it is I say when Paul says I was alive without the law once. Right. When well, was he alive without the law? You mm -hmm. know, it was after he had mm -hmm. trusted Christ as right. his savior, and then he put himself under a self-imposed mm. legalistic yeah. system that's a common view right. that's a common view i uh, i'm uh i had uh, i think david david reed and i are probably on the same page about this because that was one of the first questions he asked me yeah. when we got got together <laughs> and i said look i think i think this is him uh having eternal life before he reaches the age of accountability well that's a little bit complicated for me that is that is that's when i, I read chapter far seven more simple the, the, than what the, he said the whole per the, the whole intent and purpose behind the passage is practical not positional yeah. it's it's rooted and anchored in the positional and you know it's that because of the conclusion of the chapter he, he's not talking about his his past condition he said who shall deliver me yeah. from the body of this death right. i thank god through jesus christ our lord right. he's he's talking about his present tense and future tense deliverance in a practical sense in his walk and his life well you consider romans 7 5 for when we were in the flesh you know i think you have the context there as a is past tense uh explanation of the struggles he went through when he was under the law and in the flesh and that would be the context to him being alive without the law once also this past tense reference to him being in the flesh and how but sin, then, but, uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, but then believers certainly have the ability to get in the flesh. I mean, you get out of Romans oh, yeah, 7 absolutely. you go to Romans chapter 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then you get to this famous verse here, uh, 17, for that which I do, I allow not for what I would that I do not, but that I, what I hate that I do. And I'm, I'm very much persuaded that that verse is talking about his struggle to, behave to have a righteous walk in the flesh under the law could not be done mm -hmm. because everything he wanted to do he wouldn't you know everything he hated he did and he and this is a struggle that he had in the flesh under the law i i think before his conversion people try to apply that verse to us today and it's not to say that we, we, there's not a struggle there and you're not um tempted to give into the flesh but here you have in that verse i mean complete and total 
I mean, failure as, as, a, and I'm mm-hmm. not, and I think that's what life was under the law in the flesh. And you get to Romans eight and you have this contrast to what we saw in, in Romans seven, you were un, in, un, uh, um, you were, uh, of course in Romans seven, you were under the law, you're freed from the law. You had total failure in Romans seven and in Romans eight, you have, uh, you are enabled to have perfect victory. You're able to, you, when he could not fulfill the law in Romans 7, you can perfectly fulfill the law through love, walking in the Spirit in Romans 8. Uh, you are in the flesh in Romans 7. And he says in Romans 8, you're no longer in the flesh. And I think you have this great contrast here between between the, the life that he had in the flesh mm-hmm. under the law versus the life that he has now been mm-hmm. given in Christ in in the Spirit in um in Romans 8, but I, you know, I'm open to anything you have to say. Well, again, Romans 8, he says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. He's writing to believers there, and he's talking about them and their walk. So it is possible to be in the flesh. That's the reason he says through the Spirit, we have to mortify the deeds, deeds of the flesh. It, it's all about walk. Yeah. Both chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. Yeah, please read them as a, as a unit there. And, uh, <laughs> well, when Paul, when Paul I, says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Uh, something happened. Um, the commandment came and Paul, Paul to me, uh, was misapplying the commandment and mm-hmm. it killed him. Uh, but then, uh, Pastor, in Romans 7, 1, he, Paul says, uh, for know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. So I would get the impression from that parenthetical that he's talking to the Jews and he's talking to those who who had experienced what life was under the law. Yeah. And I would say a lot of people have experienced the performance issues of the law. Mm -hmm. But Paul, you know, coming through there, he is teaching us a lesson. I think you can learn whether you see it one way or or the other. And uh, and he's leading us to the answer in chapter eight. Now. Uh, just notice here, uh, Chuck, how awesome these guys are when you try to, how <laughs> mm. <laughs> wonderfully gracious, you know, level headed, yeah. how fantastic they are when you have differing opinions on, yeah. on, uh, on a certain subject. Romans seven is one of them. And I, I, you know, I think we would all agree that, uh, I was alive once without the law has made every pastor scratch his head, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but, um, I uh, love those thoughts. Thank you, pastors. Uh, let's see here. So there you go, Chuck. You're, you're going to have to take both sides, and you're going to have to decide for yourself. Um, let, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Hey, Josie, how you doing? Hey, Great to man. see you. Bill Barons, my beautiful brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, that's some beautiful artistry. That kind of – he's got this uh, artistic belief – it's almost kind of like an '80s uh, poster in Florida. <laughs> I love that's, that's artistry. I love. I love that. I think that's beautiful. That's a great. That's a great um, uh, profile photo you've got there. Uh, let's see here, Cliff Matthews. What does he say? He says, uh, uh, "Verse nine, Paul's talking about being alive before it reached the age of accountability." Yes, Cliff. Cliff. Cliff agrees with me. Thank you, Barry. Larry. I always knew you were the smart one. Yeah, in the group. Well, he just he just fell a few pegs in my mind. You know? I mean, how do you get the age of accountability? There's nothing in that passage that leads you to to uh, uh, an age of accountability. Question. Oh, sure there is. Well, because he talks no. about. No, uh, I say no. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Because uh, in verse seven, what shall we? The law sent nay. I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, "Thou shalt not covet." And this is before he get to verse nine. So he's talking about. I mean, Paul. You know. Uh, uh, so you. He's talking about a period where the law is teaching him that he's a sinner, which has to be when he's young, and before he reaches the, the age of accountability. And then, you know, has to be. (laughs) Well, the the proper logical conclusion that you that you should take is that he's talking about life before Well, well, there's a lot of people would say the same. (laughs) I won't. I won't mention another particularly controversial subject, but a lot of people say that this has to be a position from Scripture when it's not that obvious to everybody. Well, the idea here is, you know, yeah. I think take the verses at face value in context, of course, 
And I, I think it's, it's simple. And yeah. other explanations, as I've heard uh, today, <coughs> seem to be a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is the one that seems complicated to me. Let me ask you this question then. Uh, how, all right, if, you, if you're going to suggest that this is Paul wanting to go back under the law after he got saved, how do you explain verse 9? He says, for I was alive without the law once. And then he says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. How do you explain that? I'd say that's the that's the, the truth of the reality of a lot of believers who are saved by grace and then influenced to go back under some sort of legalistic system. Yeah. How did and they were alive? They they were experienced joy and happiness and uh and fruitfulness until somebody comes along and says, Well, wait a minute. What about this principle? And they'll put you under performance-based system, and it just like sucks the life out of you. Yeah. How the uh, how is it that he died? If he wanted to go back under the law, commandment came, sin revived, and he died. How could he die if he's already been transformed as a believer? Well, I would say I'll practically. See, yeah. So you don't believe that people can be <laughs> dead in a spiritual sense that they don't walk in the, in the truth. Uh, you don't believe that people can, as Paul would say in Second Corinthians chapter six, receive the grace of God in vain. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, the, Galatians, uh, even Galatians two twenty. <laughs> I am <laughs> crucified with Christ. Do you believe, I yeah, live. Yeah. And, well, me... and, and second, and, and Galatians chapter two and verse twenty one. How would you? How would you then <laughs> frustrate the grace of God? I can. <laughs> If righteousness come by the law, that's when you die. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because the, 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 yeah, th the one thing I don't like about that position is that this suggestion that Paul wanted to go back under the law after he got saved. Where else in, can you back that up? Somewhere it else in Scripture? It doesn't say that he wanted to. It said that he did. There's a difference. <laughs> well, where Sometimes you just slip back into old <laughs> habits. I mean, he's lived under the law since he was a kid. All right. It was habitual. All right, so back it up with Scripture. Where else in Scripture do we find Paul going back under the law, flipping back into the old habits? And do, You don't find that anywhere. So he in writes a whole chapter and, on the subject, and that's not enough for that's you. That's not enough. You know, <laughs> well, it just means you can't squeeze a square peg into a round hole. The, it's a, there's a different answer to the, what the chapter I thank God the Holy mind. Spirit says, I covered that so completely and simply <laughs> that we don't need to devote any yeah. additional time to it. Yeah. It yeah. just makes no sense to me, but I'm, yeah. I'm open. I am open. I will listen. I'm open to what you're saying. No, I don't. You listen. I don't. But you, know, you, you notice when he stuff. says, "I'm open to what you say," he's really meaning by that. Not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'll I, listen to it, but I'm not yeah, going to actually re-examine and entertain it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I like anything. I'm open to listening. To, I mean, you have changed my mind about a lot of stuff over the years, and you've done. The, I mean, you're, you're fantastic with the way you do it. But the Romans seven stubborn. thing just doesn't click with me at all. You're being real mm. stubborn on that. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think we see the evidence of it in our own lives and <laughs> the lives of other believers who, who for whatever reason, they revert back to uh, to either legalism or they revert back to their old, uh, the flesh. Uh, you have in uh, uh, verse uh, 14, for example, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. How can that not be a description of who he was before he got saved? Carnal, sold under sin. Law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. I would say read First Corinthians and <laughs> you see a great chat, chat, a whole book, yeah, about the carnality mm -hmm. of the believer. Yeah, um, uh, I'm open to being. Uh, it's that's going to be hard to pursue oh, there you away go. from yeah. that. I mm -hmm. can't, I can't, I can't fathom that it's that's Paul after his conversion. No, you have to believe it before you can understand it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, hey, we got Robert Craig in the yeah. house. How you doing, brother? Good to see you. Good morning from Holly Springs, Mississippi. Finally got back our power after the ice storm. No. Oh, wow. that had to have been rough. Robert, you need to move to Orlando. You don't have that problem down here. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, it's great having you here. It is. Uh, hey, we got Justin in the house. Just in time. Awesome to see you. Uh, Chuck says to the panel, I've been thinking about John 20, 11 to 12, when Mary looked in the sepulcher. 
and uh, seen the two angels. She was looking at the mercy seat of God because in the Old Testament, the mercy seat had two angels on it. Um, mm. Possibly, possibly. Um, There's a lot of things I've never crossed my mind, and that's one of them. Mm. And it doesn't mean it's not, not true on some level, but I, uh, I think the point is that he just, he's not here for he is risen. I had not, uh, I did a message on the angels at the tomb when I was going through the angelology series. And, uh, I remember basically reading everything that had been said about the angels. Um, I don't, I don't good. remember encountering that yeah. in commentaries, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. So oh, go ahead, Pastor. That, you know, I was just thinking in, in the sense uh, they were there in, in a sense guarding it. Uh, they were there uh, like cent centuries. Uh, um, uh, I'm thinking, for instance, um, how many angels were banning Adam and Eve's reentrance into the garden? Wasn't it two? With flaming swords, yes, yeah, I believe so. If if I if I remember that, but yeah. I, I I don't get the I don't get I the, don't the mercy seat being likened unto. Uh, it, I mean, it's not uh, like they're a, on an altar, a coronary or, slab, or anything like a yeah, mm -hmm. or anything like the interesting Ark though. of the Covenant. Now, John twenty. Um, uh, when I preached on it, uh, you have here John 20, verse 11, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, uh, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Sepulcher? Sepulcher. I know everybody says sepulcher, but there's the U before the L. I don't know why. We... It's silent. Uh, is it? <laughs> and see it's two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. I bet you that's where... Chuck gets his idea that it's similar to the top of the Ark of the Covenant. You know, and I can see that, actually. That, I, uh, yeah, but the Ark of the Covenant ran horizontal and not vertically. So they, they, they were side by side, and their, the picture of, from the tabernacle is their wings actually overarched it. Uh, so here's the mercy seat, and they're, and they're there overarching it. I, I don't get that. That particular image um, applying from the sepulchre. You know, well, it says here that lesson on it. the one they were they were inside the tomb, so one standing at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I don't know. I'd say it's I'd say it's questionable. I, I but you know, I can mm -hmm. I can see what you're trying to say there. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Um, which was that that line was a struggle in because w one of the biggest problems for me w at the the whole resurrection scene at the tomb is the figuring out the chronology of everything uh, extremely difficult. In fact, I think uh, I don't know if it's possible to figure out the chronology of everything, um, but in any event, um, and because. If you look at the chronology, it would seem that Mary came back to the tomb after she'd already met with um, met with the disciples. She because it would seem that she saw that the tomb was empty. She went and told the disciples that Christ has risen, and then and then she comes back and she's weeping again. But then again, maybe the chronology is wrong, or maybe her mind has been infected by the unbelief of the disciples, and so she comes back and just assumes that his body is dead, and she just suddenly changed her conviction about his, him being resurrected. I don't know. It's it, That part is confusing to me, and I'm not sure I, I have the answers yet. If anybody has any thoughts on that, I'd love to know. If anybody has any thoughts on the um, chronology of events there, I'd mm -hmm. love to know. In verse 14, and mm -hmm. when she had said thus, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, he's done this before in the past mm -hmm. where he had um, made himself... Um, uh, people just simply uh, would see something different than what he was and um, and not be able to recognize him. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that in his resurrected state, Christ had the ability to appear and disappear as he did with those two men on that road to Emmaus. 
Mm -hmm. uh, even in the Old Testament, when Christ appeared to the people as the angel of the Lord, he had the ability to appear to only right. one person while the people around him couldn't see him, right. like ba like Balaam in Numbers 22. Mm -hmm. But then that moment's amazing. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, woman, mm -hmm. why weepest thou? Yeah. Whom seekest thou? Mm -hmm. And then she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus said unto her, Mary. <laughs> Something else I just recalled. Verse twelve. You see, she saw two angels. What yes. were what were they doing? I don't know. I they mean, were sitting. sitting. Uh, yes, 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 sitting, yes, yes. right, not standing, right, sitting, right. Now that's a different pose than what you have atop the ark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're wingless too, apparently, because mm -hmm. they don't have any. Uh, we're not given that description. Mm -hmm. I'm not attaching any great significance to that, but I do notice that, you know, there's there's a difference there. Yeah. Of course, you get to that uh, famous verse, mm -hmm. you know, she when he says Mary and she turns around and then she sees him and mm -hmm. then she recognizes mm -hmm. him and she's like, Master. And, and Christ said to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mm -hmm. So Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that mm -hmm. she had spoken. He had spoken these things to her. Uh, why did she say, touch me not? <laughs> That's not controversial at all. Since we're doing controversial yeah. passages, um, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to the brethren. He gives us the reason you know, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. I don't know what necessarily the significance of that was, except for, I don't know, contamination in some way. I, I don't know. Um, I freely confess I've never settled on one explanation or the other. You know, uh, how could he be contaminated in his resurrected state? Um. Yeah, good good point. So the Lord, um, the Lord Just tells add, add to the things I don't know. The Lord tells Mary not to touch them. The two Marys leave together, and the Lord appears to them on their way to the disciples. Matthew twenty eight nine tells us that they immediately fell and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now, why would Jesus tell Mary not to touch him, only to allow both Mary both Marys a short time later to touch his feet? That was another question I had. And why would Jesus say to Mary Magdalene to go to my brethren and say it unto them, I ascend unto my father, if he's going to ascend uh, to the father and then descend back to earth before they even had a chance to tell the brethren? Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. And surely the Lord didn't ascend to the father and descend back to the earth in between the time he spoke to Mary and Ma Magdalene privately and when he appeared to both Marys, or did he? Yeah, did you? You did say certainly because right. I don't know that that's certain. But uh, how long um, does it take the Lord to travel to the presence of His Father? <laughs> <laughs> now, this was the best I could do on this topic here in these in these notes from mm -hmm. an old sermon. But some suggest so. Some suggest He did, and so why would He? You know, and everything I read, everything every dispensationalist had to say about those verses, and they were totally varied. And Schofield would highlight three common views, the first being that Jesus speaks to Mary as the high priest fulfilling the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 5, uh, 16. Having accomplished the sacrifice, he was on his way to present the sacred blood in heaven, and that between the meeting with Mary in the garden and the meeting of uh, Matthew 28, 9, he had so ascended and returned, which is a common, uh, which is a view that he would say is in harmony with the types of Scripture. In the Old Testament, William Newell, in his Hebrews commentary, would write, Well, some have even pointed out, pointed to our Lord's words to Mary Magdalene, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto the Father, declaring that he has on his way on that day of resurrection to fulfill the type of the high priest and placing his blood before God as the Levitical high priest sprinkled the blood in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, quoting Leviticus 16, 14 to 17. There shall be no man in the tent of meeting when he goeth in to make atonement. And so 
One of the questions I would ask in light of that was, what then mean our Lord's words to the cross? It is finished, right? Why would he need to do something to complete something that was already finished when he was on the cross? Mm -hmm. Now, if the sprinkling of his blood before God in heaven was necessary to complete the work of atonement, then what does it mean? It is finished, you know? Uh, what was finished exactly? Mm-hmm. Atonement. His substitutionary atoning work was achieved at Calvary when he said it's finished. Mm-hmm. Now, the putting away of sin before God by the sacrifice of himself, that's what was finished. And I would ask, why did the Lord have to present his blood in heaven? Even under the mm-hmm. sacrificial system of the Old Testament, the shedding of blood was here on earth. There's nothing in Leviticus 16 about blood in, in heaven. And you consider also Hebrews 9, 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So what is that holy place? Is it not? in, In Leviticus 16, we have a type of Christ and Aaron. He entered the presence of God in the holiest of holies with a blood sacrifice. But Christ entered the presence of his father the great throne room in heaven, the Mm -hmm. holy place in heaven with the sacrifice, Mm -hmm. and he entered only once, which had to have been after his ascension. Mm -hmm. So So which ascension are you talking about then? The one before he went home permanently. At 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 Acts chapter 1? Well, there's there's one big hole in that whole argument. And I'm open, I'm uh, actually legitimately open to anything you have to say. He said, don't touch me because I haven't ascended yet. Plenty of people touched him during the 40 days and 40 nights. That's right. That he instructed well, the disciples, were... including Thomas. Right. right. So right. nothing had changed between this particular time and Acts chapter 1 when he ascends. So why would somebody else be allowed right. to touch him because he hadn't ascended, but somebody else could? Right. So, so that... that I'll shoot down these other theories, too. I've, I've, got, I've got two other ones. The uh, two other theories that Schofield had. Number two was that Mary Magdalene Mm-hmm. Knowing as yet only Christ mm-hmm. after the flesh and having found her beloved, sought only to hold him so while he, about to assume a new relation to his disciples in ascension, gently teaches Mary that now she must not seek to hold him to the earth, but rather become his messenger of the new joy, which would mm-hmm. ultimately lead to his ascension. Mm-hmm. Uh, number three, that he merely meant, do not detain me now. I'm not yet ascended. You will see me again. So run mm-hmm. rather to my brethren, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. the, after having studied it out, my the best, I, the, the only thing that can make sense to me was that it was a combination of these two theories. The Lord knew that mm-hmm. Mary was what, what she was thinking and feeling, and she needed to adjust her expectations mm-hmm. about Christ. Now she's, she's not saying don't touch me, make me unclean before I ascend to heaven. He's saying, don't cleave to me as you once did. Before I, before I died, because things are things are not going to pick up where we left off. Mm-hmm. He's not going to be establishing the kingdom. I will be ascending mm-hmm. to, to the Father, and you need right. to tell the brethren that I'm alive, but I'm not here to stay. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. But I could. But, but I'm. I'm. Could be why wrong. does there? Ha- you know. And again, I I've heard those other theories about the blood and, and that type of thing. And to me, I, you're going <laughs> back into typology, and it's almost the product of imagination. I totally agree. Why does there even have to be a deep reason other than the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, who just died, he's now been resurrected, and he goes back to see his father? Right, right. That could be as simple as that. Yeah. Do you think he uh, wanted to sneak off and steal the Ark of the Covenant and take it up to heaven? (laughs) <laughs> be careful be that, that theory be all over the internet <laughs> well there you go chuck i hope you feel like you got your money's mm-hmm. worth on that even though um, we did not answer it yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. well we're kind of like maybe probably not yeah you know, that's right. kinda, mm-hmm. um, i mean haven't there been times when you all you wanted to do was to go see your dad uh you want to ch- yeah I totally agree. Yeah. And thank him for that. With, with no with, with no particular, you know. Hey, Pop, thank you for that resurrection. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that, yeah. that was good. Yeah. <laughs> to me, yeah, that, to me that, that makes, I as, mean, much, I, that makes as much sense as the other. <laughs> That's right. Sin killed him, you know. It's, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you want a really hard study. I dare you to figure out the chronology of the events at the tomb at, at his resurrection. I mm-hmm. dare you to figure it out because mm-hmm. it's really difficult. And yep. that's what I always think about. You know, it, 
it's the, the answers are there and we can um, certainly they can be over time understood but chronology sometimes can be very difficult mm -hmm. uh okay david chumney's in the house what's going on big guy all right, so we have Adam being made in the likeness of God. Why hasn't he given the knowledge of evil so that sin wouldn't enter the world through him? Christ can't be just a reversal of Adam's original position. That's a great question. Um, there is, um, I did a whole message on the tree of knowledge, and there's a lot to be said about that. Um, okay, but let me say it again just so we can think about it. Uh, Hal's already chomping no. at the bit. Adam being made in the likeness of God, wasn't he given the knowledge of evil that sin, so that sin wouldn't enter the world through him? Yes, yeah. I think he was. Christ yeah. can be, can't be just a reversal of Adam's original position, right? The knowledge of sin is not, he didn't, it's not that he did not know what good and evil was, because very clearly God had made that clear. He didn't have knowledge of evil in a personal sense, having ever experienced it. Right. Uh, to me, that's that's a totally different thing. Knowledge of good and evil. I mean that that is the. Uh, uh, I think that bounces around the question that many people have: that is God responsible for sin? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. I mean, sin was a choice that. And so we get back to the, the will of man, mm. the will of man. He just simply gave the privilege that God gave him to choose and chose to, to do wrong. Right now. And uh, I think the scripture then is clear that mm -hmm. sin entered in the world because of uh, Adam and Eve. One thought that I had was that Adam gained the knowledge of good and evil because of the very existence of that tree and the rules about the tree. So you have a tree, you have the rules, right. and thus he, mm -hmm. he, he understands now good and evil. Good mm -hmm. is obedience to God. Evil it's is God. disobedience. Mm -hmm. And in that, he's being trained as preparation for his encounter with Satan. Long story short. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, I like that view. Do you, does that sound okay with you? Well, I think that's true. And I, th and I think Adam understood the reason that, that God had placed him on earth and in the garden. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, he was to be fruitful. He was to multiply, and he was also to subdue it. Right. right. What was he to subdue? Right. Uh, if you have a perfect creation and there's and and there's nothing that's fallen, what would there be to subdue to conquer? Right. N absolutely nothing. Right. So I I think he understood his his uh, purpose uh, in this conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan. Right. I, I think that was part of his basic instruction. Right, right. Um, we do know one thing. We know that as far as the capacity of sin, that he had the capacity to sin. The other thing that we also have to, to acknowledge is that he did not have a sin nature. Right. Yep. People say we sin because right. we have a sin nature. Well, Adam sinned. He had no sin nature. Lucifer sinned, and he didn't have a sin nature. That's right. What did they have? They That's had right. volition. That's right. Volition. That's mm -hmm. right. He, they they were they mm -hmm. made a choice right essentially right and and volition in that particular sense <laughs> you say knowing good and evil in, in, in what sense if you know what's good and you know what's wrong you know what good and and evil, and evil is that reminds me of um, something you and Doug Dodd taught me when it's going back to Romans five fourteen where Paul said that death reigned even over them that had, had not, not sinned yeah. after the similitude Two. of Adam's transgression, mm -hmm. which, you know, speaks of the way that Adam transgressed. How is it in that context of that chapter that we're not sinning after the way that Adam sinned? Because that verse isn't about what Adam did, but how he did it, which was by choice. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. <laughs> Once we were in bondage to sin in the flesh, our sins were hardly ever a choice because we were slaves to sin. We right. sinned out of habit, mm -hmm. which became our nature because we yeah. were in bondage to the flesh. Right. So how is it that mm -hmm. Adam sinned when he didn't have a sin nature? Yeah. Adam sinned by making a choice. Yeah. He chose to do what he did when he could have and should mm -hmm. have said no after having been taught about the difference between good and evil through that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right. So now that our sin nature, now that now that we, our souls are freed from that bondage to sin in the flesh through 
the transfer, the spiritual transformation of the baptism of the spirit, we are now, we're now, our lives, our sin in our lives becomes a choice just as it was for Adam right. back in the, in the garden. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I hope you, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> You know, we get we I get I give a soundbite for as an answer, and yet it took hours <laughs> to to to, uh, to uh, try to somehow understand the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And I totally confess, I I find that I have all my life wondered what that was all about. Mm. I never never did could wrap my brain around it. Uh, Bill Barron says Romans eight twenty six. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we walk. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. All right, let me ask you the hard question here. Is the the Spirit helpeth our infirmities? What does that mean exactly? How does that happen? Well, read Romans chapter 8, verse 1, down to <laughs> verse 26. There, there's oh, all, that's too easy an answer. Oh, that's, that's, that's too easy. He, he quickens our mortal flesh. When we uh, when we yield to him, uh, you got all types of uh, he uh, re, um, helps us with our identity, knowing who we are. Uh, there's there's so many things that that are specified that the Holy Spirit does for for the believer. Uh, he you notice it says he helpeth our infirmities. It doesn't say that it removes them. Right. Yeah, and it says that he we don't know how to pray for as we ought. And so to me, it says we should know how to pray for, we should know what to pray and how to pray. But the infirmity, of course, would be the, the flesh. And the flesh is not, it's not always intuitive with what God's desire and will for us to be. But there's one thing, and that's the Holy Spirit knows. Mm -hmm. um, uh, love that, Bill. Hey, Bill, I hope you're doing great. Uh, yeah. Amen, Bill. Yes. Yeah. You give him a bunch of, give that man a bunch of hugs. Uh, David Tumney said, this is part of my Romans five study of being taken out of Adam and put into Christ. I know there are some equalities. Um, I have in the, um, I have in the book now, I don't know if you have, and I don't, I won't have a chance to go through the whole thing, but if you want, you can, you can um, download a free PDF of the book. And there's a whole section that I really loved. Uh, which was about uh, the comparison between being in Adam and in Christ. Um, let me see here. Um, um, and I can't remember where. It, let me let me find it out here for you. Uh, because you have like. Oh, let me just do it this way. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is so if you if you download the PDF, go to page forty three, and uh, under the subheading of what is the old man, it has a lengthy description of the contrast between Adam and Christ in Romans mm -hmm. five, and First Corinthians uh, fifteen. I bet mm -hmm. you probably explored this also. I'll just give you a snippet. Adam's the first Adam, whereas Christ is the last yeah. Adam. Mm -hmm. Adam was made a living soul, whereas Christ was made a quickening Queen spirit. spirit. Adam was the first man earthly, mm -hmm. whereas Christ was the second man, man heavenly. heavenly. Sin entered the world by one man's disobedience, whereas the righteousness of God is now extended to the world because of Christ's oh, obedience. obedience. In Adam all became dead in sins, whereas in Christ all became alive unto God. In Adam we have death, whereas in Christ we have eternal life. In Adam we bear the image of the earthy, whereas in Christ we bear the image of the heavenly. Mm -hmm. In Adam we have judgment, whereas in Christ we have justification. Mm -hmm. In Adam sin reigns, whereas in Christ his grace reigns. Right. Amen. In Adam we become unrighteous, whereas in Christ we become righteous. righteous. By one man's disobedience, all were made sinners, whereas by Christ's obedience, all who place their faith in him are made righteous. Mm -hmm. In Adam, the law entered so the offense might abound. In Christ, where sin abounded, his grace did much more abound. Amen. In Adam, sin has reigned unto death, whereas in Christ, his grace reigns mm -hmm. unto eternal life. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Well, like Big difference between being in Adam and Christ. Being in Christ, yeah. yeah. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, Bill Barron's uh, Romans eight twenty seven, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, right. because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, hey, Carl Coates is in the house. How you doing, brother? Brother Carl, man. Uh, he calls you calls Freddie Bear his favorite gentle preacher. <laughs> Gentile. Ah, <laughs> Gentile preacher. That's right. That's right. And how he loves house Facebook posts. And greetings to all on here today. Greetings to you, my dear brother. Amen. I love getaway car so much. I want to <laughs> play it at the beginning of every 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 podcast. Uh, Cliff Matthew says, uh, as soon as the separation of God by our own decision had to be made through which God could demonstrate his love so he could experience that forgiveness and reunion personally. Um, I like that. I like that. Huh. So we probably answered a question he deleted. The problem is with live stream with the stream yard that we use. I don't know what what questions get deleted and what don't. Sorry, dude. <laughs> but I thought it was a perfectly wonderful and uh, wonderfully worded question. It was great. Yes. Sorry, I answered it anyway. I do have a, a tablet here now, and I do try to keep a, uh, keep a watch out on on comments that are deleted. But I don't. I'm, I, I oftentimes miss it. I think you are correct. I see Romans seven as Paul being transparent about trying to be a religious man like he had been for his whole life, and the futility of it compared to living by faith. Oh, Chris. Well, every Chris, brother, that might, that every might brother has to. Every brother has the liberty to be wrong in grace, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you, man. I, yeah. I just, anybody, I'm yeah. Roman 7, I totally understand. Yeah, well, I'm sitting here looking at you as you're saying that. So, <laughs> and I agree with that sentiment completely. Well, I mean, I would love to agree with both Fred and Hal on Roman 7, but then we'd all be wrong. So, um, John Snodgrass, how you doing, brother? Hey, yeah. Old timer's disease got me this morning. Yep. <laughs> yep. Do you guys have that problem too, old timers disease? Yeah. Uh, Chris Wake says, up with it, go to bed with it. Without the ifs, ands, and buts of the law and the brutality of failure, the law represents totally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he says, You were having extra pancakes. That's right. Wow. And Josie says, Yes, death and reversionism, right? So That's stuck right. and not looking at Jesus Christ. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, say something brilliant. Well, I was trying. I was just thinking of a comparison. You're talking about the old man and comparing it to the law. Now, is the old man dead? That's what I heard. I read. Do, I does it. that mean then that the old man no longer has any influence in your life? I say that uh, I'm going to, that's what I used to say verbatim. Mm -hmm. He's dead, but I'm still being influenced because of my dad's been dead since 1980 and I'm still influenced by him. Exactly. And, but the only influence that's there is the influence that, that you give to him mm -hmm. is the law. In that sense, he said that he took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. He did. And he said, that which was against us. Well, if it wasn't possible to take that which was had been killed, the law was dead, it was taken out of the way, why would he have to write a, a, an entire epistle on people that were putting themselves back Batman. under that that he had been taken out of, if it's already dead? Right. <laughs> I, I see an analogy between the two and yeah. that and, and the old man. The old man, we can still live by the habits that we totally. uh, it, that were ingrained in the flesh and 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 go back to that way of thinking. Uh, we can give him a power, even though he's dead, that he doesn't have. Yeah, the I same think, thing is true in the law. You know, I, I I become comfortable over the last couple of years referring to the of the influence that that we would I previously attributed only to the old man mm -hmm. is now I attribute it to the, the flesh because right. that's where his life is now lived. Well that's where the habits 
of the old man reside is in the flesh. Uh, okay, so there was some back and forth here about um, – uh, we got Tara in the house too. Awesome to have you, uh, Paul yeah. Lucas, and the Soul Sleep message. I have not heard it. Um, I uh, we had just sort of uh, briefly uh, talked about it yesterday. Um, you know, I, I you know it's just uh, difficult for me to watch uh, a lot of stuff. I have um, uh, Mondays in particular are really bad. I've got to after the podcast, I'll might get a bite to eat, and then I'm spending the entire afternoon working on Wednesday night, and then I've. I collapsed and took a nap and then I prepped, uh, spent the night prepping for the podcast today. Um, and, uh, so time is really, has always been an issue for me. So I haven't had a chance now, Paul Lucas too. I love the brother. I love him to death. I'm concerned about his direction, getting involved with the sonship guys. And, uh, my prayer for him is that he stays in mid acts dispensationalism with, and, and he, uh, just steers clear of, of that nonsense. Um, and uh, I, but and I think he's uh, raw talent, raw talent in need of uh, just a, a good uh, accountability partner or something along those lines to keep him from uh, going astray. But he's, you know, he, like any brother, he should, you know, certainly explore everything he wants to explore. Uh, but I just pray he doesn't go down that path. Um, I have imagined David Osteen would be a great mentor for him, and I trust he is uh, keeping him on the on the straight and narrow. Um, and, um, and soul sleep's a fascinating subject, but, uh, we were just, uh, since you just, since the subject was brought up, we highlighted it a little bit yesterday. Um, and I hope, uh, Terry, you, it's great to see you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Lourdes says that Christ had the sins of all in him. When Mary met him, he had to present them to his father. Mm, no. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that, I know that's, that's, any, that's, any a, that's a view that people have. I know, yeah. and uh, and I, we, I mean, mm -hmm. I think she wrote this at the time we were talking about it. When we right. Were, so right. I don't, I wouldn't recover it again. And, and then there are those that believe that Christ actually went and suffered in hell. Yep. Yep. Which is absurd. Which yeah, is absolutely absurd. Yeah. Why should he suffer in hell to pay, pay for, for sins it. when it was already finished mm -hmm. before he died? Right. That makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, good one, Joel. Sneaky Jesus stealing the ark. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so it's 1130. I do have one quick. Okay, actually, let me see here. Uh, Robert Craig says, I don't believe the ark needed to go back to heaven. It was only a copy of the original in heaven made after the pattern shown to Moses in the Mount Right. Yeah, that's that. It, that is a perfectly valid view of the reference to the ark at the end of what is it, Revelation eleven. 11. Um, perfectly that the that the ark that John saw at at the end of that chapter was the earthly, or the heavenly version and of the earth, the heavenly reality of the earthly shadow. I, sh I should say, or it could be that the ark just took a little trip up. Um, uh, I love the Ark of the Covenant. It's uh, ever since uh, I was a boy and saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's one of my favorite things in the Bible. Uh, and frankly, the stories of the Bible are far better than anything you'll find in a Spielberg movie. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is phenomenally, endlessly fascinating. I did a whole series on it before we started on YouTube, and I lost those notes. So I wouldn't mind doing another study on the Ark of the Covenant just because it's really cool. Um, I read a bunch of books about it, too, and um, theories about how it disappeared. Um, and um, I'd love to know what you think about where, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant, because I totally uh, I, am, I think that's a, a great theory that you just mentioned. Uh, Cliff says, uh, I was made of wood and gold overlay. That copy would be just uh, powder by now. Yeah, there's that possibility. That possibility. Uh, Carlene says, I believe Adam and Eve were given a free will to obey or disobey God's rule. And amen. all the saints said, amen. amen. That's right. None of this Calvinist determinism here whatsoever, Cliff <laughs> says. That's right. Um, although I don't mind talking about Calvinist determinism because mm -hmm. Cliff has the best comments about it. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Josie says rewards for good works. What should we focus on? Loving more? Being strong and confident in God more? What works? I think those works are, okay, are, let me ask the pastors instead of, 
<laughs> what, how would you define a good work in, uh, for all of us grace believers in the age of grace? What's, what's a good work? Well, when we let me go to uh, let's go to First Corinthians chapter three. There you go. Yep. Uh, there you go. That's uh, uh, I, that's you. You are saying the very thing I know Freddie Bear would say. Well, brother, <laughs> let's look at the context. Let's go to First Corinthians yeah. chapter three. Right. And he talks just like that too. I know. I know. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting to me because there's there's an awful lot of discussion about. Work and works. And there's some people say, well, it, work is used in the singular, so it's not talking about works. Well, it depends on what the work is. You know, when you take in, and you read, uh, we'll start in chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So what do you think he's talking about building here? He already identifies the foundation. The foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and he has laid that foundation. He said, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what is it that's being built upon that foundation? Are you building works or are you building a work? Well, you can. How would you define that work? I would say that it's it's the life or the walk of faith that, that a believer has, the 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 structure of his faith. Where the plural comes in, he said, "Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble." That's that's. There's plurality in that. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. different elements. I would say that 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 the. Uh, the um, what's the word I'm a metaphor there is the quality of the works of the elements, the quality of the of the materials that are going into the structure that's being built. So, yes, I believe that there are rewards for works. Amen. Those works are the elements of our house of faith, if you will, and, and the house of our walk. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can, <laughs> right now my foggy brain's not putting it to get any better than that. But uh, I think Paul yeah. uh, identifies for us what a good work is mm -hmm. and, and started in the verse that you did in verse 10. Mm -hmm. A good work is anything that the believer does today, which is according to right. the grace of God, which is given to me, Paul, right. as a wise master builder. I right. laid the foundation, another built it thereupon. And if we, when we build upon the foundation that was laid by Paul, that's why he can talk about the foundation he's laying uh, of the Lord mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. As we know, he's not talking about Jesus Christ according to the kingdom program. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. The mystery. Yeah. So he says, that's why it's so important that we take heed how we build thereupon, because mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. two different messages about the Lord Jesus Christ to build mm -hmm. upon the foundation of Christ mm -hmm. laid by Paul. Mm -hmm. It's either the kingdom program, mm -hmm. prophecy, mm -hmm. or it is according to the revelation of the mystery. Right. So a good work is done with things which were given uh, to us by our apostle, the doctrines given to us by mm -hmm. the apostle Paul. Right. Uh, now, I think... Um, for me, one of the great uh, examples of uh, what to focus upon and what will determine the kind of reward that will survive the fire at the Bema seat and what's the difference between gold and silver. I love the illustration of the um, Ephesians 6 and the, the servants. He says, Ephesians 6, 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ not with eye service as mm. men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, mm. with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Yeah. Amen. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Right. Now you just would know most of the time they would make uh, take that. Uh, these verses and just basically apply it to the workplace uh, for most mm -hmm. of us. And so, you know, so just as an example in the workplace, I mean, are you, I mean, mm -hmm. are you doing your job correctly and everything, but 
the Lord, the Lord looks at more than that. What's your, what's your motivation when you do it? Are you doing in singleness of heart? Are you serving at the workplace as if you are serving Christ himself? Where's your heart? Where's your mind? Mm -hmm. What's the, it's not just what you do, but the motivation behind why you do what you do. And, uh, and I think that's the great distinction between those top tier precious stones, gold and silver, because, you know, he's, he's not just looking at what you do. He's looking at why he's looking at the heart and he's looking at, you know, the, the, the attitude, the tone. I mean, he's, you know, he isn't, mm. he, there's no stone that'll be left unturned in terms of, of, uh, you know, why you are getting that, re why you are, or aren't getting that reward because mm. why, what's the deal? Because with those works that he's judging, he is going to uh, unveil uh, reveal the secret counsels of the hearts mm. and your motivation behind that work you're doing. So, I mean, mm. I'm with Fred. I, I think uh, the work is uh, good work is anything you do in the Lord. It's not just what you do, but how you do it and why you do it. Right. If you do it according to the graces given to the Apostle Paul, you'll do it for the right motivation. Mm. Right. Well, he also said Christ works in us both to will and to do and of his good pleasure. good pleasure. He also says that we are his workmanship created where? In, right. in Christ Jesus. You uh, notice it says unto good works, right. not unto good work. work. Right. And, you know, in this illustration with Ephesians 6 here, you know, <clears throat> with the application of the idea that those verses about servants would be applied to the workplace today, he calls he calls the servants, first of all, to be obedient to their masters or our bosses today. Well, at the, at the workplace, for example, are you obedient? Do you show up to work and do you do a good job? If you do mm -hmm. good, how's your heart? How's your heart? Where is your heart while you're at work? Are you going through the motions? Or are you serving with real reverence in singleness of your heart as if you were serving Christ himself at the workplace? You know, do you serve mm -hmm. as men pleasers or do you serve as a servant of Christ doing the will of God from mm -hmm. the heart? Mm -hmm. You know, are you serving with good will as to the Lord and not to men, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so, you know, Paul says in verse eight there, he makes it clear that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. And the reward isn't just based on obedience, but the quality of your service and the heart with which you serve, which should be as if you're serving Christ himself. Mm. Um, that to me Amen. is the great distinction about. Well, it's not only the distinction to me, it is it is the key to being able to do it. If you, if yes, you, work, totally. for, yep. if you work for someone that is basically despicable <laughs> have, have you ever have you ever worked to, worked for someone of, oh, of, of oh, low character many 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 yeah and many. yes that doesn't change your responsibility as an employee to that individual amen so how could you possibly have the right attitude and working for that person right without doing it for Christ, rather than, I, I'm not going to do it for that person. Right. I mean, why in the world would I want to do anything good for that person? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. And well, you're not doing it for that person. You're doing you're, it as exactly. if you were doing it under the Lord. Right. Right. So it mm -hmm. doesn't change anything. That's the thing. No, it doesn't matter how awful the world is and how awful these people behave. Doesn't mm -hmm. change you. Doesn't change you. Doesn't change what you do and mm -hmm. how you do it. It's it, nothing. It makes it, no difference. You do right because it's right. It's you don't right. love somebody because they deserve mm -hmm. it either mm. yeah you know love is not conditional mm. um so i i hope you enjoyed that yeah. uh, little monologue there josie mm -hmm. hope you feel like you got your money's worth uh outside but the other a part of um i think that strength and confidence is an inevitable result of a lot of time in scripture you know, uh, I don't think you should be focused on strength and confidence. It's just something that would come naturally with a lot of time in Scripture. Uh, love, you know, you should be an expert on 1 Corinthians 13. I think every believer should be. Mm -hmm. Not just love, every aspect of love. Every mm -hmm. one of those yep. particular qualities of love. They should. You should know them like the back of your hand, and you should seek to embody every one of those principles. And when you realize how love operates, it helps provide the, you know, the direction about how to deal with any situation, you know, what the attitude should be. It also informs you as to how your tone should be, how you should approach that person. 
I mean, I think First Corinthians 13 basically answers everything about it. Yeah, it every does. every situation you're in that may be difficult, First Corinthians 13 gives you that direction out of it. Um, uh, Chuck says, I think I opened a whole can of worms. Yep. That's right. <laughs> We're going to go fishing. It's not too, it's not that bad a can of worms. We had in the early days uh, some folks in the live chat that would really give me a hard time about uh, Romans 7 and uh, almost daily. And I'm just like, we're not going to debate Romans 7 again today. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. We already did it yesterday and the day before. I'm not, not, we're not doing this every day. Yeah, the people decide you're just uncourageable. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see here. Uh, hello, Edison. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Uh, cherubim and seraphim are the ones allowed to be so close to God. Yes. Uh, it is a question in my mind as to whether or not cherubims and seraphims are the same or different classes. I never, I, I was inclined to, when I did the angelology series, I was inclined to think that they were separate, but I'm open to the possibility they may be the same because when you start digging mm -hmm. into the word seraphim and you start, and it's very much, uh, I think it was like a fiery spirit or something, which is exactly how a cherubim looks. So yeah. there's that possibility there that the that the two words yeah. are describing the same class. Yeah. I haven't looked at that in 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 decades, but it seemed to me, did they have the same number of wings? No, the in fact, um, the seraphim and the cherubim had different. The, different in fact, in fact, no, in fact, I had to. Um, uh, um, you study the cherubims, and there are. You know, you have this, for example, the cherubims in Ezekiel 1, mm -hmm. you know, they had, I was it, four wings, mm -hmm. four hands, and four faces, and mm -hmm. all that stuff. But the cherubims that are on top of the Ark of the Covenant have one face and two wings, and yet mm -hmm. they're called cherubims. Mm -hmm. So then you have, to con I would, I, I, you have to conclude that they may be of the same class, but they vary in terms mm -hmm. of number of wings, number mm -hmm. of faces, number right. of hands. Well, you can also have variations because of perspective. Because if you were looking at one face head on, you wouldn't know that there were four. four. <laughs> you would only know that there was one. And depending yeah. on the arrangement of the wings, you might only see two. Well, that's that's possible. That's possible. But uh, I, you know, I mean, what's being recorded there is what's seen. Uh, you know, there's a bazillion of these angels, so <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think there, you know, the, it, probably room for some variation. But yeah, that's possible. Yeah. I would, yeah. Um, and uh, but that's that's still if you can figure that one out for me, Cliff, yeah, I appreciate please. it. I haven't I never did settle that in my mind. Um, all right. What do we have here? Feldick uh, taught that God's doings since the beginning was first natural, then spiritual. I'm, I would probably need a context to that. And um, I love I love Les Feldick a lot. And I rarely disagree I, I like um i like a lot that he teaches in fact i'm going to quote him tomorrow night um but i'm not sure i understand the context there and i would need a bigger explanation before i could uh, wrap my head around it um one thing great about Romans 7 is that Romans 8 follows. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. That's right. Well, that's right. The sad mm -hmm. state of affairs. Yeah, Romans 7 is the thing that you got to sit through until you get to the good stuff in Romans 8. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, John yeah. says, just as with everything else, it starts in the mind that we are constantly renewing. The old man wants to uh get out but we have to press him down do not feed this kid um and then john says uh just as with everything else it starts in oh okay all right so he just corrected the the thing uh the only thing about the old man i i would we would suggest that the old man from romans 6 6 is dead d-e-a-d -E -D, dead he's gone the only thing left is just the way he used to think is still lingering in your head, in your mind. And you need to put off the way you used to think before you got saved, mm -hmm. which is basically the way the old man used to think. You mm -hmm. also put off the corrupt communication of mm -hmm. the old man because right. the old man is dead yeah. and you need to start embodying the heavenly. Right. No matter what metaphor you use, it's going to fall short in some way. But uh, one of the things that we've used to describe, it's like taking a corpse and strapping it to your back and carrying it around for the rest of your life. Yes. Uh, Cliff says, uh, thank you, brother. Cliff says, yes, Paul has toned down the SE lately. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, every man, ha you know, how when he was young, 
you know, he, he went into college with his King James, uh, and then he walked out with what? New American Standard. New American and were, Standard. And he was a five-pointer. Yeah. And then after that, he, you know, he studied his way back to. Mm. Amen. Uh, I just imagine that even in Paul's case, he would just with enough time in the word, you'd probably be able to discern that uh, some of the mistakes. Well, I mean, some of the mistakes I think the Sunset Edification guys uh, make. And, um, you know, he'll, he's smart enough that he can study his way back to he, he'll he you know, what works for him is what does the word say? And he stays on that track. He will. I'm sure he'll do just fine and get back to a place where, uh, so that's good to know. That's good to know. I'm, I, um, I, I'm rooting for Lucas, Amen. honestly. Yeah, me too. Um, Lucas has a, he's a raw talent. He's got a lot of energy. I think he needs, you know, he, he, I think he studies, but then he gets up and kind of sometimes just rants on what, whatever it is he wants to talk about. And he needs to be able to be disciplined enough that he can, he goes to a conference, he's given a topic, you preach the topic. You don't go ranting about something else, kind of thing. And uh, but he is uh, his energy, his ability to communicate, uh, his understanding of the word rightly divided, phenomenal, phenomenal. Love him to death. Um, uh, Robert says I tried watching Paul and his style, just that he could uh, hardly preach without bringing up the flat Earth thing. Oh, he's a flat <laughs> Earther. Oh, Explains isn't that cute? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hal loves to mess with the flat earthers on Facebook. <laughs> he gets them all riled up mm -hmm. like a bee's nest. <laughs> uh, hey, Mike Moriarty's in the house. Brother it's, Mike. It is not that I sin, but sin that dwelleth in my flesh. My old man and, my, and in my flesh, not my old man dwelleth no good thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Bill Barron says SC is covered in his uh, Friday night Zoom meetings. Um, did not know that. Uh, he has, uh, Paul has pulled away from that one too. He used to be more a Ruckmanite in his views. Uh, there is a lot of um, Ruckmanite manner in, in the way that he preaches also, which for me would be a little bit of a concern. Not, um, Ruckman had... I mean, his claim to fame was you had enemies. You get up there and you tear down those enemies when you're preaching behind the pulpit, rip them a new one, and then mm. and then move on. And he was that Bruckman's nastiness is just uh, anti. It was just a antithetical to the life of grace and the life that we're supposed to be leading, especially behind the mm -hmm. pulpit. Uh, there's no room for Ruckman uh, Ruckman mannerisms in grace at all. Mm -hmm. I can't right. uh, the way he was and the nastiness with which he. Ripped people apart. Mm. There's no room for that in grace. Well, the reason I almost rejected the KJV position was because of Ruckman. I, I told and that, was, and I told Jordan the first time he was here. I said, I, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to hang out with you guys because of Ruckman, and I just yeah. assumed anybody who's right. KJV only is is like militant that. and nasty right. and awful, mm -hmm. just like Ruckman was. That's what I told his his uh, disciples. I said, if this is what it means to be a Bible believer, then I don't want to be one. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I'm just like, if 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 that's what the K, if that's if all the KJV only guys are like that, I don't want to have any part of it. Right. Don't care. I, I want to be. I around just it. have to say, you know, I'm a KJV Bible believer, in spite of him. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And uh, I mean, I did love to see the debates between him and the Roman Catholic priest, but. Uh, it, it was a bloodbath. And, and Rubin Rubin called us mid axe guys the. Uh, Dry, dry cleaners, cleaners. Dry yeah, cleaners. That's it. and of course my response: <laughs> at least he admits we're clean. <laughs> uh, I had a, I had a rug tonight uh, come up and said, "You're just a dry cleaner," mm -hmm. yeah. and so I right. said, "Well, what does that mean?" Praise the Lord. What mm -hmm. does that mean? You got to get wet to get clean. I mean, you know, got a mm -hmm. baptismal regeneration. <laughs> he just stomped yeah. off. Yeah. I, I do notice that Chuck says here, "Why should I use only a KJV Bible?" And uh, you know that that is a a very lengthy study, but I would say uh, I would like to just briefly answer that. It's because of the text that it's translated it's from. Place. Right. Uh, most people just totally miss that connection. They think it's an issue of translation. It's not an issue of translation. It's an issue of text. 
Yep. And uh, that you'd have to do some homework on. That's not something you're going to satisfy your your need to know in, in just a couple of sound bites or reading two verses. It's, it is. Uh, I, we talked about yeah. this maybe yesterday also. I mean, the issue with all the modern translation is the con- inclusion of the min- corrupt minority text that has right. basically corrupted that entire translation. Um, and, um, you know, as Hal said, it just. You can trust it. It's accurately translated yeah. from the right text. Yeah. Uh, Mike says, um, need to quit blaming the old man for your sins. Blame shifting started with Adam and Eve. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Yep. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's, you know, what somebody said, that if, if it weren't for weren't for uh, Eve, uh, we'd still be back in the garden uh, eating strawberries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not apples. Yeah. Do you think the kingdom is a return to the garden? You know, well, I, it's called I, I, the kingdom of heaven on earth. So, but n- I don't know. It's the garden. Of like uh, there's no. some Christian songs about going back to the garden, and this is mm. what everything is designed for mm. all of us to go back to the mm. garden. And I'm like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. No, there's still going to be a, there's still going to be similarities. And and when is the new heaven and the new earth come? It, it comes after the millennial reign. That's, That's right. when the earth is going to be burned up, if you will. Amen. And, and there'll, be there'll be a new heaven and a right. new earth. Uh, you know, the new heaven and the new earth, that's that's the garden without without yes. a tree of knowledge right. and without you know any mm-hmm. need to uh, deal with evil and sin and choices that you're making there. Um uh, let's see here. It's good to have you here, Cliff. Right. Uh, uh, beloved Josie says, "Amen." The mystery of God's grace revealed. Grace, grace, grace. Love that. Amen. And I love, I love your questions. Also, Josie, uh, you uh, often uh, keep us on track to keep the podcast mm-hmm. practical in a lot of ways, which I greatly, greatly appreciate. Uh, so I love your questions. You have any any questions about anything? Um, I love, I'd love to hear it. Uh, um, D.E. Alexander says, Paul Lucas is clearly speaking against soul sleep. I imagine he would, and uh, I would agree with that. I would agree I would agree with that position. Um, T.K. says, I've been reading your book, Joel. I want to grow in my understanding of who I am in Christ, and you're helping me to do so. Thank you. God bless you, Joel. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it took me three years, so I'm a little... Uh, and and the problem I'm starting I've been I've been so acquainted with that book so intimately for so long now. Uh, the problem with me for that book now is just that that and I very much appreciate it. But I rewrote those paragraphs so many times. I look at it now; it doesn't even sound like me. Uh, so we we are on Thursdays is book day for me, and that's the day that I uh, work. I'm working on the sequel, which is all about the application of identification to your walk. You know, how how the identification works in you going through suffering, how identification works in your interactions with others. You know, the the application of what we of the the base doctrine you learned in the first book. I'm going to call it the grace life. I want to make it more sound more like me. I'm not going to rewrite it so much. I'm going to have a lot of humor in it. (laughs) So it sounds like an actual Joel Hayes book. (laughs) John Sondgrass uh, and Charity is at the top of the building being built, reflecting the foundation. Hey, I like no, that. I like that. Amen mm-hmm. to that. Mike but, Moriarty says the old man dead has everything to do with identity and not and not why you sin. Uh, yeah. You are born with a sin nature, which is embedded in your flesh. Amen. Uh, Cliff says, uh, what would that make Gabriel? Um, I had to, I had that same question. I suspect that he would be. Uh, a cherubim or cherubim, one of the two, because he is in the very presence of God. I think that's what that verse in uh, Luke talks about. I also have a theory that Gabriel just might be the angel that's given John the big tour of everything in Revelation, simply because you you know when when the biggest prophetic information was revealed gabriel was the one that revealed it hmm. you know he's he's the one that came down and said to gave daniel the the whole 70th week hmm. gabriel was the one who told mary she's mm-hmm. going to conceive yeah. and have the messiah the son of god mm-hmm. who's going to you know when 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 you have the biggest most earth-shaking news that the lord himself isn't revealing he gives it to gabriel so i think i have a theory that gabriel is probably the angel in revelation uh, I love Gabriel, and not to mention the fact. Don't get me started on Gabriel. No, not to ahead. mention the fact 
you really pay close attention to the way that he interacts with Daniel and the way that he interacts with Mary. He is so loving and tender and affectionate with how he talks to them. And you see in Gabriel this deep love for humans that, you know, we are told exists with all the angels. Um, and I find that I find that absolutely amazing. Um, I did a whole angelology series. I loved my time with Gabriel, I, and I as, as I, I just think he's amazing. Hmm. He's really amazing. Um, would you say the bookend then might would be Michael? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Michael was the one that disputed with. Yeah. You know, yeah. Over that's right. His body. Yeah. Uh, Michael is referenced in Revelation, so I can't help. But, well, I don't. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, I mean, kind of yeah. like kind of like the two, the bookends. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Very much. Uh, I had some. I, I think there is a hierarchy amongst the angels. I don't know who's at the top there, but Gabriel and mm -hmm. Michael are up there. Um, um, I think there's only one archangel, if I remember correctly, because of the wording of some of the scriptures. Um, Chiita says, great podcast. Hubby and I are really enjoying it. Hmm. We'll give well, Hubby another, the ones. Give him another hug and a kiss for us. You can, there's, there's no such thing as too many. No. Uh, all right. So we covered that. Hey, Persis, my sweet sister. How are you? Yes. You beautiful woman. Great to see you. Just wanted to share God's love, joy, and peace, and his comfort to saints. Amen. Beloved Joel, Fred, and Hal, and Mile. Yeah. I think she meant Mike. Yeah. I'm going to start calling him Mile. Mile. Miles. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Call him Mile. That's a uh, dog I really love named Mile. Consider thyself, lest ye also be tempted. The, the day is early. That's, That's right. right. Mm -hmm. That is Galatians 6 6-1, and that is a very – uh, important verse we often we often quote here, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, dealing with a believer who may be caught up in some sort of egregious behavior, sinful behavior, or some wrong thinking. You know, you had better approach that person with the right tone, mm -hmm. the right spirit, and you, you've got to be humble. Well, meekness is strength under mm -hmm. control, but you've got to be gentle and humble because you've got to recognize you're perfectly capable mm -hmm. yourself of making mm -hmm. those same mistakes. Well, it's not just that same mistake. It's also this idea of trying to classify sins. And, yeah. and I've, I've come to the view that if you're tempted to take and look at some terrible sin that someone has done, it's no worse than the last lie that you told. Amen. <laughs> John, John says, well, I'm just kidding. No, actually, I think it was a very good thing uh, to remind us and everybody else about the tone that we should have mm -hmm. when you're talking about somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I... <laughs> I totally, uh, Chuck says, don't get me wrong. I love the King James. And that is, uh, the only Bible I use. Someone asked me that and I can't answer him. Right. It's a, it's a very big subject. Um, and it was, it was hard for me at the beginning to condense the thoughts to a soundbite, but you know, the minority text corrupts everything. It's garbage. Mm -hmm. Uh, the application mm -hmm. of grace, uh, Joel, how wonderful. When will it be out? A couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to I was for the longest time putting together a book on um, on suffering. And I just nobody's excited about that. book. <laughs> but he called it the grace life and the application of grace, talking about mm -hmm. love and speech and everything. Oh, well, they get excited about mm -hmm. that. I said, OK, so I got to re re rethink things. Um, and um, I also I'm going to I have also been working on PDFs for. Uh, the angelology series, uh, just take, just take the notes, put it all together. And I don't intend to have it published, but just put it together for people's reference, you know, from that series. And then also do, I'll probably do that with the, uh, end of the world series also. Um, but yeah, I'm going to, I've got a number of other PDFs I'm going to make available for free to people. Um, John Snodgrass says, uh, remember in Second Kings, I think it is, the angels gathered around the throne for a conference about killing Ahab. Yes. In fact, Jordan talked about that not too long ago. Mm -hmm. I love that story dearly. Um, and uh, I'll just, uh, there's a lot about it. You know, it's, you have here, there's, one of the things uh, that I loved about it, you have here the angels to gather together, and he asked the angels for ideas about how to take Ahab out. The, the, you know, you would you you all you grow up going to church and you just kind of assume God knows what he wants and what he wants to do. And you would think that he would then, you know, just tell the angels what to do and it's done. 
but here he has a kind of a meeting and he invites them to mm-hmm. think about this mm-hmm. situation and think mm-hmm. about how you can actually achieve his goals. And they're all offering suggestions. And I think it's him teaching, guiding. It's an interactive mm-hmm. experience with the Lord mm-hmm. about taking a certain direction he wants to take, which is just amazing. Well, you see the same thing when the negotiation between uh, Abraham and and the Lord was yeah. Yeah. about going down to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Yeah. 50, 40. Yeah. 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 It was a negotiation. I mean, why would, why would God even be asking? Yeah, exactly. Abraham. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Hey, what do you think about this? Right. You know? Right. (laughs) And so he creates all of these angels and he just loves to interact with him. He, Mm -hmm. He loves to get them to think and participate in the his heavenly government and Mm -hmm. and uh, participate in the direction that they could take to achieve a certain goal that's amazing Mm -hmm. and in that you know i can't help but wonder if that might help to also inform us as to maybe a general idea of what our um life is going to be like in Mm -hmm. the heavenly seats with those angels he's Mm -hmm. we might just be given direction and we will with the angels come up with a solution and and go down that path Mm-hmm. And, the, and you know, whatever we come up with would be perfectly righteous because it's all going to be in perfect synergy okay. with God's God's uh, nature and his will. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, kind of that sort of thing, mm-hmm. I expect. Mm-hmm. It's not like God's going to call you up and give you orders and then you, mm-hmm. you got to do it. I think there's a there's a give and take there. Well, he likes that with his creation. Well, again, that's just another evidence of, of volition. Um, yeah. It, couldn't could he create the angels? So they're just like robots. Right. You know, it's well. You know, uh, and it's like, why does God ask man questions? You know, why mm-hmm. does he ask him when he already knows the answer? Mm-hmm. But he does it anyway because he likes that interaction mm-hmm. with his creation. Okay. I think I think that's amazing. Um, Robert says, I th- I'm seeing a pattern among our right dividers, the ones that embrace salvation of all, a la Pilkington. Is Pilkington a universalist, no- yes. universalist now? He is. Uh, also say that the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock. Oh, yes, that's very true. And they, uh, well, at least uh, with Rodney, he went down, he was long, he had long abandoned judgment seat of Christ before he became, started really um, teaching universalism. I don't really have anything more to say about that. Um, yeah. I just hope, uh, I just hope all those brethren, those, uh, they come back to the word, Amen. to the knowledge of the truth. I hope they just come back to the, to the elements of grace. I don't even understand the necessity for the judgment seat of Christ if everything was predetermined That's by right. God. Amen. Amen. Or exactly. the great white throne. Amen. Totally Why would happy. anybody be published punished for something that they had no control over? Amen. If it was predetermined. Yeah. Right. right. I guess, right. I guess Just, according to yeah. universalism, the, why even have the great white throne? Exactly. Nobody be there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. All right. So let me see here. Uh, Mike's like, thanks, precious. Love you in the Lord. Am I missing Amen. anybody? Bible talks here. How you doing? Great to see you. Um, every decision we made ought to be with the Lord, by his spirit, his word, spirit and life, kind of deep, but not really. Uh, I, I think it's not deep enough, frankly. Uh, you know, the will of the Father, you know, the words of Christ, the conviction of the Spirit, everything is in perfect unity with the the thinking and the the attitude and the love of the entire triune Godhead, all of whom ex- reside inside of us. Uh, I don't know. I didn't really make it that much deeper. I tried. Deb, I thought, uh, all right, so what do we have here? Uh, John says, Adam, uh, where are you? God knew he wanted Adam to say it out loud and be accountable. Right. You know, I, I it, always, it always shocks me in the Gospels when Christ is asking questions to the disciples. He knows he already knows the answers. You know, he knows what they're thinking oftentimes. Uh, and I find that amazing. His love of interacting with them, even though he already knows stuff. Um, uh, Bible talk. Uh, I've been praying and spending time with Jesus, but also... 
dealing with an individual who's accusing the brethren of not knowing Jesus. The individual is a universalist. Well, I don't know why the universalist would be accusing people of knowing Jesus, not knowing Jesus, because it doesn't matter. You're a universalist. (laughs) You can do whatever you want, live however you want, believe whatever you want. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. I don't know why you'd be griping about that. (laughs) Why did Christ have to die? Um. Uh, Amanda, it's great having you here. Um, the uh, and I, I hope I hope you're doing well. I really do, and your family also. Um, and uh, we'll keep we'll keep praying for everybody and your ministry to them. Amen. Uh, hey, how do we get that free gift of eternal life? You know, the uh, the Bible contains probably the greatest love story ever told. I don't take that word. Probably, Amen. Take the probably out That's of that. That's a nice opening. Yeah. Good. That's good. Yeah, the greatest love story ever told was not about Romeo and Juliet. It was about God's love for uh, for man. And when we under when we see the effect that sin had when it uh, when it uh, had such a dramatic effect on the absolute righteousness of God, Amen. there were several things that He could have done. Well, He did create hell. Uh, for the angels, the fallen angels, and for the place where uh, man is going to be cast alive into the lake of fire if, if they don't trust today as if they don't trust Christ as their Savior. But we see such a great story about God's deep love for mankind. Uh, he would have been absolutely justified in saying, okay, uh, Adam and Eve sinned, the effect of sin went upon all mankind, and so therefore everyone, regardless of their faith and whatever, is going to be cast alive into the lake of fire. But we see the evidence, but God commendeth his love toward us, which is which is which uh, speaks to action. It mm-hmm. speaks to purpose and intent. Mm-hmm. He commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, one of the things I used to just ponder over, shouldn't have, but I pondered over, you know, why when we think about God's love for us and the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, yeah. you know, we we can see the impact of his love, his mercy, his tenderness, his understanding that Christ died for our sins. The only thing that really, when we see the what the effect of sin has, is to understand that sin can't be winked at. Paul tells us that. Sin has to be paid for. And, of course, it had to be paid for with a righteous man. And so God, in his love, in the example, the greatest example of his love was when he allowed or sent, if you want to say it that way, he sent Christ to Calvary. But Christ willingly said, Father, I will go and die to pay for their sins. And then God would then say, okay, I will accept that payment. It's it's nothing else. And that's where religion is confusing people and sending people to hell. The universalists say, in essence, sin, I guess maybe they're saying sin has been paid for completely by by the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore no one needs to act on that. But Paul tells us it's unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only remedy for the payment of sin, which is death, is for you to express your will, your free will, your conscious decision, your own volition to believe when when God says that my son died for your sins and you'll believe that. And what does it mean to believe it? It means that you're willing to, to place your eternal destiny in the hand of God based on your decision and your choice to trust that Christ, when he died at Calvary, died for your sins. And where are you going to learn about that? There's only one place when we come to find out exactly what Christ's death at Calvary means for us today in the dispensation of grace. That's Romans to Philemon. So that's why you can be so confused if you're trying to mix and mingle different gospel messages. But Paul clearly says that it was the Lord Jesus Christ that died for our sins. And uh, God says, if you'll believe that, I will give you the gift 
and uh, the gift of eternal life. So we, we beg you, implore you today, be ye reconciled to God. Amen. Trust Christ as your Savior. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sean Davis, uh, I just want to point out, I hit a couple of comments that came up here. I think the plan to kill Ahab shows how God can still use a fallen devil for his plan. Uh, I think the uh, the way I've often framed it is, um, you know, if if you have rejected God, then he will allow the demonic realm to deceive you and to lie to you. And it is, and you just consider the four horsemen of the apocalypse also, the, the, you know, the Antichrist and his devastating impact that his kingdom will have on the earth. Uh, that's all part of God's determined desolations in Daniel uh, about this. This is God's allowing that to happen as judgment upon, uh, um, upon an unbelieving world. That is why God allowed Babylon to invade Israel. Uh, so, yeah, it is possible. He can allow bad things to happen even through the demonic realm as judgment upon somebody. And there was this other comment here, Persis. I loved what Persis said. She said, did you ever consider that physical suffering could be a blessing to remind us of how sin hurt our Lord and Savior? <laughs> kind of metaphorically, not cause and effect. Yeah, it totally makes perfect Amen. sense. Yeah, I love that. And look at that. We got Dan the man in the house. How you doing, my dear brother? Oh, Danny Great boy. to see you. Yeah. Uh, and he quotes Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amen. 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 Uh, well, the comments keep coming in. Mike says, plan of redemption in three letters, P-A-S. God the Father planned it. The Lord Jesus Christ accomplished it. And the Lord and the Holy Spirit sealed the deal. Amen. Uh, that's <laughs> great. Um. Uh, all right, so uh, let me, uh, uh, how about we close in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Father, we come to you this morning as always, as we are every day, eternally grateful for the salvation that we have, the simplicity of, of the gospel of grace, the fact that we are blessed with these uh, pastors here and, uh, and the, their counsel, their years of study in your word. And Father, I'm just grateful for everybody in the live chat, all the members of the, of the subscribers to the channel, everybody. And I just pray, Father, that in our time together around your word, it is your word itself that will be glorified. And I pray, Father, that all these dear saints, uh, you know, will just make effective use of their ministries in their lives, wherever they are. And I pray that the the glory of your grace will be manifest in them and that in them will shine that light of the knowledge of the glory of your glory in the face of your son. Amen. And I pray father that they'll just be shining trophies of your grace, offering the gospel to the lost, helping brothers and sisters to come into the knowledge of the truth. And I pray, Father, that all they say and do will bring honor and glory to your Son, our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we got Bible study tomorrow. Bible study tomorrow. All right, tomorrow. 10 a.m. tomorrow. And then tomorrow night I'm going to talk about uh, freaky locusts with stingers. Freaky Ooh. locusts with stingers. Uh, the fifth trumpet judgment. So come on back. I love you guys. Have a truly, truly bad day. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Amen. Bye. See you. Amen.